Welcome to Chapel Grove Church Podcast, the Bible-centered show that focuses on searching the scriptures to find answers to common spiritual questions. To learn more, go to chapelgrovechurch.com. Now to the show. So last week, me and Etienne hopped on the podcast and we talked about the idea and the concept of different roles in the church and trying to figure out what your role is. We talked a little bit about a marketing funnel and we just thought that we aren't going to have time to explain all this in one episode. So we're back today. I get to have Etienne on for a second time. We're over the moon. We're so excited (laughs) and we're glad that you're back listening. So we're going to finish up this concept and really try to drive this point home. Thanks, Chance. I hope the people listening actually enjoy this as much as you and I enjoy it. Um, and I'll just kind of briefly summarize what we talked about. We talked about different members of the body, as, as Chance had said, and how the real inspiration for this even idea was that a lot of times we emphasize the conversion part of a Christian's journey. We emphasize or we kind of like hold up as the highest and, and the most uh, uh, the champions of the faith are the ones who can get others to be baptized, which my heroes have always been preachers. And so I, I do hold them up in, in a high esteem. But that being said, it doesn't mean it ends there. There's a whole lot more work after that to make sure that they actually adopt Christianity as a part of their life. And so that's really what I want to talk about today. But I'll go through the funnel, as he mentioned, just briefly. Um, the first section, there's four main sections to the funnel. And this is gonna, we're going to get real practical in this, in this uh, episode. Four main sections of the funnel. The first one is demand generation. We're pretty familiar with this. That's where you just, at the top of the funnel, the very top, you just want to build awareness. You want people to know who Jesus Christ is. You want them to start building a little bit of knowledge, recognizing that maybe they have sin in their life, maybe that recognizing that salvation is something that's important and it generates interest. Maybe this applies to me. So those are kind of the three uh, sections of demand generation. The, The second part of the funnel is that conversion part. So you want them to get to where they are, uh, considering this, considering being baptized. Maybe they have intent. Yes. If I join um, a faith that's going to be Christianity. I know I'm going to be baptized. I know I need to be baptized, so I'm going to do that someday. Well, you need to actually get them to convert, actually go through the, the motion of doing that. And that's when you get to the third part of the funnel, which is relationship management. And it's a part that I feel a lot of this happens in the church, but maybe not as intentionally as we go about uh, the, the other parts of the funnel, the conversion and demand generation, but the relationship management is incredibly important. And so that is where you onboard them. So we're going to onboard people to their Christianity. Once they've converted, well, guess what? Sunday morning, we're all going to get together and this is what communion is. And we're going to do this together in joint participation. We're going to be studying together. So, so you onboard them until they get to adoption where they've adopted this as a part of their life. This is a a real part of their life, to the point where they prefer it. We used the example last week of Netflix, of Disney Plus. Maybe you're sitting down. You've you've gone through the marketing funnel of Netflix and Disney Plus. They want you to, um, uh, to, to adopt this as part of their life, but they want you to prefer one or the other. Netflix wants you to sit down and eat dinner and, eat, and watch them, not the other guys. So you build that preference to where it becomes loyalty, and then you get into the very last part of the funnel, which is propagation where they have that loyal, you have that loyalty to the point you're willing to refer others. And eventually you become that brand evangelist yourself. So moving forward, it looks like we're going to break down each individual category. Yeah, let's do that. I think that's a good place to start. So one, one of the things, and I'm going to go back to my purpose statement from last time too, because my purpose in talking about this is to encourage everyone listening to Search out your unique talent for that Venn diagram of what you're good at, what you love to do, and what the church needs. So now we're going to talk about what the church needs. Yeah. And I think, Etienne, even more so to let people know out there that there's a place for you in the church, in the body of Christ, and there's a job for you to do once you get here. Regardless if you think you don't have to be a great speaker to to come join the church. You don't have to be, you don't have to become a preacher. You don't have to get up in front of people to help God's kingdom yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. The so. church needs you. It really, we need you. That's, that's the ultimate um, uh, thing here. Whether you're in the church, there's probably more that we could be doing. If you're not in the church, we need you to come in. We need, you know, we just definitely want that to be uh, understood. So the first part we talked about was conversion. So we're going to kind of go through all four of those sections. So the first one talks about awareness, building that knowledge, and then generating interest. The Bible talks about in Matthew 5, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. He's talking to, talking to his disciples here. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So what I would say here is we need to be willing to share our beliefs, share our personal experiences, and spread awareness of God's power and God's goodness in our lives. What do you think? Yeah, and I mean, I think you can do that in your daily day-to-day actions in the way that you carry yourself. People are going to notice things about you. People are going to notice the things that you do and that you don't do. And I think that's a big part of making people aware is just, I think more so, more often than not, it's things that you don't do that typically other people partaking in worldly things, that they're doing it and you're not doing it. And people, that gives them just a little bit of curiosity. And they're like, hey man, why are you not doing that? Well, there you go. The door has been opened for you to explain to them why you don't do that. And it's because you're a servant of Christ. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you hit on a really good point, And that is different people are going to enter that marketing funnel different ways. Some people through a conversation, some people seeing an act of kindness, some people maybe hearing a sermon. So all of these are important in the spreading awareness. So then we have that knowledge where, okay, they have some knowledge. They're aware of what's going on. They have a little bit more knowledge. So I have a verse for this one as well. So 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, the Bible says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. At some point, we're going to have to start talking. You know, I, one person said, we should spread the gospel through our lives. And if necessary, we should use words. And eventually, we're going to have to use words. So when it comes to that, we need to know uh, what to say. That doesn't mean you, you have to know everything, but it does mean you need to be thinking about it and need to be studying to a certain degree. So we need to be creating opportunities for those deep discussions and those Bible studies, either in person or online, the content that's in our Facebooks the, and, and different things like that, the way we interact, the things that we like. We need to be willing to share that knowledge. Going back to what I said about the awareness, really, it could just be a foot in the door. It's a small, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be a long conversation. I mean, it could be a small pebble in somebody's shoe. That's, that's how it starts. That's where it starts. It doesn't have to be a full-blown Bible study. And I think everybody can say just a couple words. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, one of the things, I'll just use one of the awareness techniques that I use, Not not like I'm outstanding example of this or anything, but I have found that um, I use something called the circle of life, which is a Zig Ziglar thing. It's a, it's just a motivational speaker kind of thing, but he basically says there are seven spokes in the wheel of life. And those are spiritual, physical, financial, career, intellectual, family. I may have missed one. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't have him in front of me, but I should have, I should have had him written down. But anyway, Basically, seven. He, he uses these seven to uh, come up with as much as he can of life. And essentially, every one of these is what he says uh, you need to be investing in or you'll have a flat tire. And so I bring that up to people sometimes. I used to run uh, a couple, I've run a few marathons and I would run with people on 10 mile run. What are you going to talk about? So I would actually bring this up. I said, hey, why don't we pick one of these spokes and we'll just go through every one of them for one mile. We're going to talk about this spoke for this mile. We're going to talk about this spoke. Well, eventually you're going to get to spiritual if you do that. And people usually start with spiritual because they're curious what you think. So um, that is a, it's, it's more of a long-winded way of you doing it. Another thing that I've used or another technique I've used is just asking, what's your spiritual background? Everybody has a spiritual background, even if they're an atheist. They'll, you know, they, most people have some spiritual background. I've met non-practicing Methodists. I've met practicing, you know, this, that, or the other, but um, everybody has a spiritual background. So that's a question you can use as well. What's our next part of the funnel here? It looks like interest. So the next one, yes, interest. And that is, we want to make this interesting. 
let's not be guilty of just beating people over the head before they're ready for that. You know, some people, some people can take that. Some people need that. But uh, generating that interest, Acts chapter 17, verse 22, I think this is one of the greatest openings of any sermon. Uh, When Paul said to them, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. I mean, that's really incredible if you think about it. He made this relatable to these people. He built them up. Yeah. Made them feel good about themselves for sure. <laughs> that's right. And he said, and I wanted, I saw an unknown God. I, that's the one I want to talk to you about. Right. And uh, yeah, so he built that interest. And so that's something that we can be doing. You know, the Bible is the greatest adventure story that there ever has been. A lot of other things have been built off of the stories of the Bible, the hero's journey, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia, all these different books that have stood the test of time. A lot of them are really pointing back to the Bible, which has stood the ultimate test of time. So to build interest, we have to know what the, what's in the Bible. So that is, that's just kind of one of the points there. Yeah. The gospel itself is attractive, very attractive. It's just sometimes the way that you frame it. And, you know, like you said, you can't beat everybody over the head, but the gospel is an attractive, attractive thing. You just got to know how to give it to people. Yeah. And yeah. But we talked about that. So that's the top of the funnel. Okay. And I don't want everybody to feel like, oh, I'm just not good at that. Well, don't worry. We still have a place for you. Let's keep moving. So the next part is in that conversion. So this is more of the sales side, admittedly. So we're going to get to the other parts in just a minute. But the question I would have for those of you who are really good at this is, can you persuade those who are considering Christianity to make a commitment and ultimately convert? Yeah. And these are the high profile people that we generally think of, correct? Like the preachers and the evangelists that work on this part of the funnel. Yeah. These are the ones who are out there evangelizing or you get them a Bible study. They will. They're going to close the deal. They're going to close the deal. They will. Closers. They will show the the the, the truth. And it, it is admirable. It's something that we should um, we should be thankful for those people that, because that is a difficult job. So. Consideration, though, is the first part of this section of the funnel, and that is answering objections. So if you're in this funnel, if this is your specialty, then maybe this is your role. We need to be able to answer objections. First Peter 3, verse 15, the Bible says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So we have to be ready to address those common objections such as, you know, I think of the things that uh, maybe we're trying to answer with this podcast, think things that are common objections to the Bible or to God, such as why does God allow suffering or can we even trust the Bible? You know, being able to really point to that FAQ, if you will, um, to, for quote unquote potential buyers in a sales funnel. So a few other things that I guess I could give would be testimonies and case studies. So going back to that sales and marketing example, in a sales situation, a lot of times case studies are important. You may have a buyer who says, eh, will this really help me though? I have a unique situation. So you may have somebody, let's, let's, let's take this back to a spiritual context. Those case studies are important where you might have someone say, well, I struggle with alcoholism. Could God ever love me? You know, could I quit or whatever? You know, the, all the different things. The case studies are there in the Bible. Paul killed other Christians. And yet Jesus came along and said, Paul, Saul, Saul, you know, why are you persecuting me? And ultimately he became an apostle. So those case studies are there. We have to be able to meet those, those objections. And then testimonies, you know, that's kind of an interesting one. If you have, if, if you hear a testimony from someone, you say, well, I'm, on, I'm thinking about buying this truck this Ford F-150, but I don't know. I, I don't know anybody who's bought one. They say, well, you know, let, me, let me let you talk to this guy. He's owned a Ford F-150 every year model since t- for 20 years. Let me t- why don't you talk to him? And that testimony is going to be pretty strong. Yeah, so in the consideration part of the funnel, connection is a big, is a big aspect of it. With, like you were talking about with your testimonies. Yeah, I think, I mean, everybody has a testimony to some degree. 
you know, all you have to do is share that. A lot of times being vulnerable. So if that's something that you're good at, maybe this is where you fit into the funnel, potentially. Totally agree. So then they get to that intent state where, uh, yes, I, I have intent. I am intending to do that. I think this is, uh, well, then maybe they agree with you. Yeah, this is the solution for me. Well, it doesn't end there. We've got to invite them to take the next step once right. they get to that point. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you a rest. We need to invite them to come to Jesus. We need to kind of push them along. This is, a lot of people will have intent, and that's where they'll sit. So would you say, potentially, this is the Bible study? When you're trying to have a personal study with somebody or something like that? Most likely. Most likely that's, whether it's small group settings, private conversations, we really need to create moments where people are comfortable expressing their intent to follow Jesus, and then we need to be willing to follow up on that intent. Which leads me to the third part of this funnel, which is conversion. We have to invite them to take that next step and convince them why, uh, to really just kind of uh, close the deal. I love that phrase that you use. I'm going to read Acts chapter 2, verse 37. This is after Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and uh, he gave a just a fiery sermon. Well, <laughs> uh, kind of no pun intended there, but in verse 37, the Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart and they didn't, they, they, we, they had to do something. You know, and that's, that's the edge of conversion right there. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in verse 41, it says, those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. The ones who were baptized, those were the converts. In verse 42, it says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That invitation, I think we've got to get better at giving that invitation more often than just after we get done teaching a sermon, you know, that's not always the setting or the environment that people feel comfortable taking the invitation up. I mean, you know, it could be a conversation in the middle of the night or something like that. We have to keep that invitation. And I mean, I guess if you're good at it, persistence, if you're good at persistence, then maybe the invitation part of the funnel is where, where, where you belong. You know, it's interesting in sales training. I've only had, I've had kind of minimal sales training, but one of the common sales tactics is silence. Okay, that's interesting. Because you present the offer, you, you, you show all the things and you say, okay, and so uh, when you start to recognize that they have intent and they're ready ready to do it, you say, okay, so are we, are we going to do this? And you let them think about it. And you, you let them answer. Yeah, you don't answer for them. But let's, let's assume we've gone to that point because, again, we want to get to the points where everybody can feel valued and contributing to this, this, uh, the walk of Christian faith for others. So the question is at this point, let's say we have, we've baptized people. Are we done at this point? No, we're not even <laughs> close to being done. We like to think so sometimes though. Yeah. Okay. So I came across this quote by Michael Graham, who's the author of the great de churching. It's a, it's a book about how 40 million Americans have left churches and other religious institutions in the last 25 years. And so for some, he says the decision is rooted in, you know, maybe some deep pain. Maybe they had some really bad experiences with the church, whether that was through abuse or uh, just relationship issues or, or maybe um, just, just some different deep pain. But for the majority, for the majority of this 40 million, the reason for leaving was a lot more mundane than that much more mundane than you'd expect. He says, most people left for really pedestrian reasons like I moved or attendance was kind of inconvenient. It was kind of far away or say, you know, well, family changed. You know, we, we had a kid or, you know, just don't, don't have time anymore. And that was Michael Graham, the co-author of The Great Dechurching. And I think that's really important because if we get people to the point of baptism and then they move and just never go to church again. Well, what have we really accomplished? That's a, a big question. And that's a really good question because we haven't taught them anything. That's what you're saying in that verse earlier. If all we've done is baptize somebody, we haven't taught them. We haven't had the opportunity to teach them anything. They still have to grow. I mean, there's a lot of fruits of the spirit that they, that they have to obtain or that we hope that they obtain. And ultimately to get to the end of the funnel, like you were saying, to continue to preach the gospel to other people. 
Yeah. And they can't do that if, if that's where we stop. Yeah. I, I kind of like the example of running a marathon because if baptism is signing up for the marathon and getting your packet in the mail and you got your bib, and I don't know if you've ever run or one of these races where the night before you pin it all on your shirt, you lay it out, lay your, uh, your, your clothes out, you put the little runner tracker thing on your shoes and you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to run a marathon. Well, you haven't run it yet. You know, you've just signed up for it. And really you probably signed up six months ago or something like that. You need to be training. So the real work is about to come. And so that's when we're, that's what we're about to get into too. So the, the third part of this funnel where you start after conversion and that is, that's the relationship management part of the, the funnel. And the question I would ask you is, can you build relationships that will stand the test of time? When someone is baptized, when someone's converted to the faith, you need to think about what can I do? Is this, maybe it's not you, but maybe it is. Maybe it's, this is your time to come in and really be a friend to this person, be an encouragement to this person, just invite them over to your house. And we'll talk about different practical and tactical ways to, to build this relationship. Yeah, but go ahead. Just different aspects about it. Just being a friend or like I mentioned last week, you're a family member now. We're all part of the body of Christ and his family. And so making them feel like a family. That's what we're talking about here in this part of the funnel. Yeah. Yeah. It took us a long time to get here, but I think this is the real good stuff because, uh, and, and this mostly because this is um, something that maybe we have, we emphasize, but we don't emphasize this formally as part of the conversion process. Right. So if you've made it this far, you better hang on to the edge of your seat because it's about to get, it's about to get good. <laughs> so in, in relationship managing management in this section, there's three uh, things that we could talk about. So the onboarding that or the activation. I'm using kind of terminology from business, but I think you'll see how this applies here in a minute, spiritual things. So the onboarding, but then the adoption. We want this to be a part of your life. And then the preference, we want, we want you to prefer something. So onboarding, what is this talking about? This is really establishing strong foundations. And I have a verse for this as well. Acts chapter 14, verse 21 through 22. Here it says, when they had preached the gospel to that city, he's talking about Paul and, uh, and, and his associates, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. It's hard to make it through any kind of tribulations. Well, I, I would say it's almost impossible without some kind of friendship or family, some kind of people to depend on. And so I think that's why this role or roles are so important. And I'm glad that you're highlighting that here. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, this is something I've, I, I kind of overlook sometimes. We look at the, the book of Acts as the, the story and accounts of Paul traveling to all these different places. He's shipwrecked, he's bitten by snakes, with, by, surrounded by these barbarians, you know, all these different things. He goes to Rome, he goes to all these different places. But that's not all he does. He goes back and he strengthens the souls of the disciples and he encourages them to continue the faith. And he, that, that tribulations, he says, yeah, it's going to be hard, but really the goal is to enter the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So it really, kind of what you were saying earlier about hard times, I don't know if we were talking about this, may have been a conversation that we were, maybe that was off the air, but we were talking at one point how it's the hard times that really make us draw closer to one another. And so if we're in this onboarding phase or we're trying to onboard some Christians, maybe some of the things we can do is let them recognize there's some difficulties, but say, hey, we could use your help over here. You know, we're about to go do something hard. We're about to go do a study and so on. Why don't you want to just come along and listen, kind of help out and start involving some people? Yeah, I think that's a great way to build relationships and connections is going through a struggle like mutually as two or however many people going through that struggle together. It always builds relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Which gets us to the next part, which is adoption. And that's really integrating into the body of Christ. Yeah. You had a unique experience where you came to the church and I know you've talked about this. I don't know if we talked about it on the podcast or not, but um, your integration into the body of Christ. Do you mind just, do you want to talk about that just briefly for a moment or? Yeah, we can. I think as far as the adoption is the hospitality. 
that's if you want to talk adoption and hospitality that is where it comes in like you you think hospitality is like one of those things that you can leave out you really don't have to worry about but it makes a big deal when people are inviting you to their homes and just to share a meal it's a it's it's a simple thing it really is but i mean a lot of times i think in commercials or just yeah, commercials. Let's just go with commercials. Like you see families, what are they doing? They're sitting at a table eating. And so that's just always been a place, I think, in history for people to connect to when they share a meal, you just sit down and you make connections. And I, I mean, hospitality, if you want to say a key word for this phase of the funnel, adoption, they go hand in hand. I yeah. don't think you can have one without the other. Yeah. And, it, you know, we could have those closers, those guys closing the deals all day long, but if if we don't have people helping adopt onboard them on, then yeah. it's a it's a leaky bucket. Yeah. And I mean, if this is your if you're on a behind the scenes role that is vital, this is where you fit. You can plug yourself right in here. <laughs> and if you can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, then you can be hospitable. <laughs> you know, actually, this is something that I didn't mention in my lesson, but I, I thought about this. We think about this with new members or people coming in or, you know, who's my age that I can help. But I'll give you a different example. There's a, a woman at our congregation at Chapel Grove Church where my son, for a little while, he didn't want to go to church. And I'd try to get him like, well, we're going to church. We're going to services. So is there anybody you want to see? He's like, no, there's nobody I want to see. I'm like, nobody at all. There's nobody you want to, you want to see. He said, well, Miss Beebe gives me candy. And we might need to mention that your son, is this Moses? Th this is my son, Joseph. He's four. Okay. Yeah. That might give people a little bit of a context. <laughs> yeah. Why your son is wanting candy so bad. That's true. Yeah. So, so, so my four-year-old out of the entire congregation of 120 people said, well, Miss Beebe, who, you know, she's, she's a grandma. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to make her sound older than she is. She's, she's very, she's full of vitality and, and so on, but but she's much older than a four-year-old, but she's connected with him. And he, she, if there is one person who he wants to go see, it's Miss Beebe. And I think that's powerful. You know, that's helping adopt him in to this church family. Right. Yeah. And it's simple, a small thing, very small act. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's important to, th to remember. So I do have a verse for this one as well. First Corinthians 12 verses 12 through 14. We read the first part of this earlier, but. Uh, or maybe in the last episode, but for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. He's talking about your fingers, your toes, you have all these different members, but you're still just one body. It's the same thing with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one ba body, Jews, Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So we were we really should be integrating into that one family. I mean, this is a biblical concept yeah. for sure. And I like that because you see it right there in the scriptures. It kind of names several different backgrounds, whether Jew or Greek or slave or free. So it's people from just about every background imaginable at that time of history. And they're all coming together and integrating into one family. So you don't have to have everything in common initially, but you can still become adopted into a family yeah so yeah 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 i think that's that's absolutely true and, and it's something that maybe we forget sometimes sometimes we think that we have this this picture of what a christian looks like and it's not always the case maybe it's someone who dresses a certain way they wear a suit on sunday morning well maybe not maybe maybe they're wearing wranglers and spurs you know and and I'm not trying to say one is better than the other. We By are no means. We have all been, all are made to drink of one spirit. We need to think about what actually matters. Yeah. Anytime I think about that, I think about John the Baptist and his camel hair and eating locust and gra grasshoppers. <laughs> like he was probably not the same guy as Paul. Yeah. And he did a lot of good work for God's kingdom. Yeah. So. All right, so let's go on to preference then. So we've a, you've started to adopt this. Okay, this is part of my life. I go to church. I spend time with these people. But what about preference? Have you gotten to the point where this is what you prefer? So Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, the Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
you know, I usually just focus on let the word of Christ dwell in you, but it's in, in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So preferring one another and preferring this solution that we found. I'm going to give you an example of when Elizabeth and I went to Africa in 2016. It was a really impactful trip for us. At the time, I, I, it may have moved up slightly, but we went to Malawi. It, at the time, it was the second poorest country in the world. I believe that's right. And uh, what we found was, was really interesting. When we were at different congregations, they didn't, w- when they were just sitting there waiting for service to start, they would just start singing. They would sing with one another. And that was really impactful to me. But it was also the way they prayed. You know, they would pray. And it seemed to be without fail. They would pray, thank you for letting us wake up this morning. Um, We thank you because we were as dead men last night, but we awoke this morning. And I remember just seeing them. We'd be out in the bush and they would all be sleeping in the building that had no door, no windows. If someone came by and wanted to do something, well, there's nothing keeping them out. Uh, They're so thankful, uh, the brethren over there and the, the brothers and the sisters. And so they preferred one another. And I know people are people wherever you go. They, they have problems just like we have problems in the United States. But sometimes I think we don't always prefer to be with Christians. And I think that's, at this stage, that's what we're working on. So we need people who are helping create those deep connections, those deep friendships, and those family-like relationships. I know, I would imagine that most of our listeners out there, they have maybe just potentially one friend that feels like a family member. Well, I think potentially our end goal with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, now that that's a lot of people, but I think that's fine to have that as an end goal to try to make your, these people who start off your friends or really who start off as strangers, but to get it to where they're almost like family. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you brought up Hospitality, I think that's incredibly important. Figuring out regular opportunities to get together for general communication and fun, fellowship, and so on, but also f- creating opportunities for deeper conversations as well, which is sometimes difficult, but we have to be intentional about this, which is why I think, yeah, go ahead. It is. And we might as well share our example that we have here. <laughs> for a, a while this past summer, me and Etienne and and Trevor, another one of our brothers, the other guy that does the podcast, we would come and work out 5 a.m. And then we would go upstairs and have coffee and we'd have spiritual conversation. And I mean, there you go. We're, we're connecting deeper. We're getting some physical activity in. We all enjoy coffee. So we're having fellowship over coffee <laughs> and then we're having fellowship over God's word. And there you go. You're connecting deeper on three or four different aspects of life. And that's how you build deeper connections. That's how you get to feel more and more like family. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that one's really important, but let's go ahead and get down to the, the bottom of the funnel. So this is, um, the evangelism or the, uh, brand propagation, brand evangelism. And I think it's important to, to think about this word evangelize. This evangelize is to convert or to seek to convert someone to Christianity. At least that's the definition that I found in the Um, In the dictionary I found, they actually included Christianity. But evangelize is a word that business is starting to use because they recognize the power of evangelism. And so it's interesting that businesses are taking on this concept and even taking on the word evangelist as a brand evangelist. And the church seems to be losing some of the prowess that we once had with evangelism. So I think it's important to talk about this at the bottom of the funnel as well. Yeah, so this is where... It comes in, we're studying together. I mean, we've we've talked all the way down this funnel, and it's something as simple as somebody who is like, let's just say our our elders or people that are older is what I'm trying to get at, people who've been in the faith longer. This is where the, they have great value. I think sometimes they feel like they've lost some of their value as they've aged, and that by no means is the case. They have They bring all kind of wisdom and knowledge that, a younger person 
doesn't have. They don't have that life experience. And the fact that they're able to come and share that wisdom and knowledge with a, a younger person, a person of the same age who hasn't been in the faith as long, those are valuable individuals to the faith. Very valuable. And that's how we build better evangelism is from the older to the younger. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's how we start to get that loyalty, or maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, so that the three aspects for this one are loyalty to where you get to referral or endorsement, and then finally evangelism and advocacy. So that loyalty, that deepening the relationship that you mentioned, I'll I'll read one verse here, John chapter 15, verse 4 through 5. You've kind of alluded to this, so I'll read it. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so I use the example in one of my lessons that, you know, I've had lots of roommates through the years and I would just invite them in. And I define anybody as a roommate as someone who stayed for longer than three months and who paid me rent. And there was, I mean, it's literally... Uh, close to 20 people that, you know, when I was, after I moved out of my parents' house and and I had uh, my own house, it's like 22 different guys that I had as roommates. But I just say, well, you don't have a place to stay. Well, just, you can come live with us until you, you know, find somewhere else or whatever. And uh, that was pretty flippant and it was a good time. Some of it was good. Some of it was bad. You know, I learned a lot of life lessons, but that's not the abide in me that Jesus is talking about here. Here he's talking about you abiding in me as a branch has to grow on, a new branch grafted onto a vine has to grow onto that thing. And so, I mean, that is becoming one with this, this branch. Yeah, and I think it's a good, good chance here to go back and just point out how dependent we are on Christ and how all of our growth and everything, that he's, it's stemming from him. It's got to come from him. And that's what we're ultimately trying to get at is every one of these phases and parts of the funnel, the foundation's Christ. All the members are just trying to help you, help you in being a brick at, in Jesus church. Yeah. Or even, even a finger on the hand. And I mean, think how, think how grown in that is. Like that is a part of my hand. That is not just a component. That's, you know, my hand's not my hand without my finger. Yeah. It's just not the same. So. So you really build that loyalty. That's the goal in the next next phase here. And then, and then we get to the point where people are so enthused about it or it's such a part of their life that they start to refer and encourage uh, or, or they, they start to refer the other people to this. We want to encourage them to share the good news. And verse I have for this is first, uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 where Paul writes, What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Yeah, and I think what when you said that, what come to my mind is zeal. People that are zealous, you know how, like in any sport, let's just say football, like one person can get another person fired up, get them a little bit, get them a little bit for the spiritual conversation, zealous, and like we can fire each other up and get each other motivated to keep keep going out there and, and keep trying to evangelize and keep reading our Bible, that's, we can feed off each other and keep each other headed in the right direction. Yeah. So I think it's interesting to draw this back because maybe, maybe we don't feel like we're that closer necessarily, but we see someone who has the ability who could be, encourage that person. I mean, we really need to be encouraging them to share the good news um, with whoever they you know, might be able to be effective with. Um, a little bit of encouragement goes a long way. Yeah. It really does. Like when a guy, when a guy is down, you might be the guy that reaches your hand out and picks him back up. And that's a, that's a vital role. Very extremely vital. Your Etienne's been talking about people leaving. If you want to keep people from leaving, you're that guy that sticks your hand out when they falling down to help yeah. them back up. And maybe, I mean, just going that far, maybe you're the, the person that helps them repent. And helps them get back and get right with God. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a powerful example. I really think the only way this happens, though, the way these big, these conversations could happen is through hospitality, like you are saying, too. Having those moments where people can get together, people can have those deep relationships. Yeah, I mean, you have to have an environment for all this to happen. And, I mean, going to church, 
you got to go to church. But outside of that, you need more opportunities to get to know each other. You can't get to know each other in two hours on Sunday. You have to spend more time than that. And I mean, I think we have examples of early Christians spending just about all week long with each other. And I understand in the common time, maybe that's a little extreme, but my, what I'm trying to get at is you have to spend more time than just a couple hours on Sunday and then hop in your car and jet out as quick as you possibly can. You don't get to know people like that. You don't, if you're trying to date somebody, that's not the way that you don't just show up, eat your food and get in your car and go, you know, drive off. And so you're not going to make relationships in that same way with people that you go to church with. Yeah. And there's two kinds of two different personas we're talking to here. One might be the person who's coming, who hasn't fully adopted this. Maybe they're not, they're not fully onboarded yet. Maybe they're the ones who want to jet because, because of that. And it is on them. They have to recognize that, no, what you've committed to is, is a spiritual walk with Christ and you are part of the body. Now you need to be a part of the church, which means spending time with members of the church. But there's a second part of that. And maybe that's who we're talking to. I don't know exactly, but it's the people who see them. Maybe they are the fully adopted person. It is a part of their life. They're at church and they see that person jet out the door instead of thinking, you know, they just don't really, they're not fully committed. No, your part of your job is to onboard them and to get them adopted. So get them over to your place, get them a free meal and so on. Well, and I think what happens far too often is one person assumes that somebody else is taking care of that and there the person goes long gone yeah and we get we get comfortable in in a congregation the size of ours you said earlier 120 people that's a lot of people for one person to try to keep tabs on and so we have to work together that's why we are every individual is so important especially the bigger the group gets the more important every individual member gets in Keeping tabs on different people, you, you can, you're limited. You can only have so many close relationships. I think it's something like 10. You can only be, you know, intimately connected and in intimate friendships with like 10 people. And so if, te- if every 10 people have a different 10 people, then you just about have everybody covered. Yeah. But I think that that's a good idea to keep in mind. Don't assume that somebody else is going to handle all the onboarding. They might be the greatest extrovert that has ever lived, but that's a lot of that's a lot of pressure to put on one person. And it's not just the evangelist job. Remember, the evangelist is out there evangelizing and he's preaching. So he has his part of the funnel covered. Here we go now, you yeah. know. All you got to do is be friendly. Talk yeah. to somebody. So one thing I don't want to do, which I don't think you're doing, but I, I don't want to go spend, swing the pendulum so far as to say that uh, to to let anyone off the hook necessarily in that it, let's just use the football analogy. Let's okay. say let's say you're a you're on defense and somebody throws a, a pass or something. And you're blocking the guy. You could actually intercept that ball. Go for it. Yep. Why would you not? And and so I, I think. I want to use this as an illustration, this, all the different aspects of the funnel, because I really want people to recognize and hit where they're hardest. But, uh, if there's ever a chance where you can hit any of those other aspects, um, yeah, do it. Yeah. Go for it. You might as well. I mean, and what's, what's the worst case scenario? The person that's trying to leave ends up with two conversations. Oh no. (laughs) Two conversations, you know, two friends there. Yeah. I don't think that ends badly. Yeah. But you're, you made a really good point, too, with uh, expecting one person to do all the onboarding or one person. A lot of times, if someone brings someone to the church or close the deal, quote unquote, we expect that person, well, they're, they're friends, so they're gonna, they should be good, right? Well, it turns out that person might need a break, and uh, they've, they, they need the person who baptized them. May, that's what they're good at. Maybe they're not good at the onboarding part, like you said. Um, it's time to come in and see if they need any help and, and, and really add additional relationships so that that person can really feel adopted into the fold. We're going back to the body one more time. And let's say the person that brought them in, they're the eyes and the person they brought in is the ears. They still need a mouth. They still got to eat some food. <laughs> and so there you are. You're the mouth for them. Yep. Go in there and help them. 
You did say something that I thought was good. You, you got to go to church. You made that statement. I think that's a, it's true. And I agree. Those out there who might be listening, it's like, wow, why do I need to go to church? Yeah, I'm just going to throw something out. It seems like from this conversation, I ought to be self evident that the church is put in place for a reason because we are relationship beings. I mean, we, you put someone by themselves their entire life, they're not going to do great. That's just not going to work out. There's actually a verse in, uh, I meant to look this up in Proverbs, he who isolates himself is not wise. And I try to remember that verse. But I do want to mention something about this going to church. We, re- we sometimes quote Hebrews chapter 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as to see the day approaching. We use this verse and we talk about it as you shouldn't forsake the assembly, you, shouldn't, you need to go to church. But what's the verse right before it says? What does it say? Verse 24 actually says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. So it's contrasting. So instead of forsaking the assembly, what we should be doing is considering how we can stir up love and good works in each other. And so that's really, when I look at that contrast, if you're going to use verse 25 as don't go to, you know, you need to keep going to church, then we need to use 24 to say, we go to church because our purpose is to stir up love and good works in each other. So that's really the reason we're going. It's one of the, one of the biggest reasons for me. Yeah. And I think that's a a good thing to lead us into the end of this (laughs) podcast. I guess y'all probably weren't expecting this, but me and Etienne together can be a little bit long winded, but we really hope that you've enjoyed the content that we've come up with. I know it was a lot more exciting having having my partner in crime on with me. We hope that you'll continue to listen to the podcast and we'll see you next time. Thanks guys. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy the show, please give us a positive review to help continue to spread God's word. If you have any Bible questions and you would like to have them answered, please feel free to contact us on our troublegrovechurch.com website. We also have a Facebook and an Instagram. So feel free to reach out, just send us a message. And until next time, we'll see you later. Have a good day.